So, um, welcome everyone um, to Podchat Live episode number 77. And um, Craig and I are a little bit personally uh, personally proud of this one because we, it, we're sitting here 23rd of April 2020. And uh, it's exactly a month to the day since the UK at least went into lockdown. We went into lockdown on the 23rd of March. And from 23rd of March to 23rd of April, that one calendar month this is our 10th episode so for the first year of these we did one a week every week for the entire year 52 in a year and then we sort of took a bit of a break and now we've done 10 in a month which is a new record for us so uh, (laughs) expect us to take a bit of a break again after this one there is no better way to do it than with with today's guest and today's topic i love these historical episodes we've had dr kevin kirby on previously talking about the kirby sky we've had dr howard dannenberg talking about social plane theory and today we've got dr rich blake talking about uh, the blake inverted orthoses so rich thanks so much for joining us we're, we're really excited we we can't wait to hear all of your tales and we want as many name drops as possible because we know that you know you were around in california at a time when it was the absolute epicenter of the world of podiatric biomechanics you know you were taught by you know the names that we all know you were taught by val massey you worked very closely with with Dr. Dr. Weed, you, Kevin Kirby was one of your students among among many, and we're going to get into how you first met met uh, Dr. Root as well, and we're looking forward to those stories. So yeah, really, really, really looking forward to this one. Um, before we start, anyone watching, any questions you've got for Rich about you know, you know historically anything about why he hasn't retired yet off of the uh, all of the royalties of the Blake inverted device, uh, you know about. Um, <laughs> the application or the technique anything about this device at all i know we've got a few people i've seen come on who are very much embedded within the world of foot orthoses a couple of lab owners as well so fire away the comment uh, the, the questions in the comments and we'll try and get to them but rich if we may could you please with with would it, it would be our honor if you could take us back to san francisco 1981 where, where it all began okay, well, thank you ian yes um so i would say uh, a new uh, you know, fellow uh, in, in biomechanics, uh, Dr. Kirby, as you mentioned, uh, was one of my students. He, he, I, I taught his class the most because they were, when I was doing my fellowship year, he was uh, in his uh, second year and beginning to do biomechanical training. Um, uh, I got hired, so I was working half time at St. Francis. Uh, hospital where, where I got hired in half time at the California College of Podiatric Medicine. And um, one of the first people that uh, the orthopedic surgeon sent me was a patient who had had a collapsed lateral uh, tibial pafon and his knee was collapsing into valgus. Um, so he, he had a pretty normal foot, but he, but with the genu valgum, he was he was pretty everted, about twelve degrees everted from my measurements to the to the ground. Um, so I so in those days the rule of thumb was don't invert somebody more than three degrees or they'll sprain their ankle. So I I went to four degrees and I was nervous, like, okay, we can't do this. And I had spent a whole year studying this stuff. I was still nervous to go in four degrees. Well, that didn't do anything to his knee. His knee, his, his knee remained sore. Um, he was trying to, he was 45 years old, so he was trying to avoid a knee replacement. So if I could do something to help him, that was gonna be very helpful. So anyway, I went to four, that didn't work. I went to eight degrees inverted, that didn't work. I went to 12, 16, 20. Finally, on my sixth orthotic, was 24 degrees inverted. I was able to straighten his knee and take enough pressure. His knee was probably not totally straight, but it it took enough pressure that his pain went away. He was was also in a knee offloading brace, but, uh, and, and doing therapy and everything. But so his orthotics, helped him and helped him actually, I, I followed him uh, for 20 years and 20 years later, he needed his first knee replacement. Uh, he, he may have had another one since, uh, but that, that's, that was the start uh, of all of this. And then 
Uh, oh, here, yeah, here you here you see uh, in the middle the, the this this patient who had the knee valgus um, that was driving his foot into uh, into eversion, um, and I and I started you know tilting it. Well, then because I was hired to treat really the runners of the clinic. That was my, that was the orthopedic surgeon did not like runners and I, and it was a sports clinic. So he wanted me to treat the runners. I found that, oh, I could, you know, running has a lot of pronation, a lot of, in a lot of people more, there's more pronation in running than walking. And so I started using the inverted technique on all my runners, trying to figure out who, who you know, who it worked for. And it took me a couple years to uh, to feel confident to finally approach Dr. Root and say, "Hey, I'm now typically taking these athletes and tilting them 25, 30, 35 degrees." And he looked at me and said, "Sir, you're crazy. This is going to cripple people." Um, there's no way it's going to work. You can't invert anybody over three degrees. And I said, well, it's, it's different. You know, it's like, it, it's not the, I think the big concept is you're, I'm not, and, and then he didn't understand it at the time, but he did finally and, and became one of my biggest supporters, probably my biggest supporter, is we're taking somebody from an everted position and we're moving them to a more vertical position. There's no way somebody who is standing 12, 13, 14 degrees everted is going to sprain their ankle if I can't get them to vertical. Uh, so anyway, but that was his, his initial response. Uh, I also spent a lot of time with Dr. John Weed, who was, I, I spent one day a week, even into practice for, for about four years, working with him on biomechanics, trying to learn it. And, and it, was, it was around 1982 that he, you know, I got there and he was treating a, treating a child, 14 year old boy, who um, had their terrible flat feet and, uh, and Dr. Rue wanted him in only Oxford shoes. Now put put a teenager, you know, playing basketball in Oxford shoes. It just so the child was crying. He was looking at his mom like, "Oh, this is terrible. I can't, I can't do this." And the mom's going, "No, you got to listen." So I I when when Dr. Root when Dr. Weed left the room, I said, "Hey, this is a perfect indication for." Let me let me show you what the inverted technique does, and because I was pretty confident by that time, and I said, let me make him a 25 degree inverted orthotic, and and see if that way he can wear his tennis shoes, because you know the the, the softer the shoe, the more support you need from the orthotic. The, the harder the shoe, the less support you need from the orthotic. So uh, that was. That was the first patient I had with him. It, it was very successful, and and he then also became uh, one of one of my supporters. So, so my, that, was, that was sort of the early days of, of me, you know, trying to get this technique, uh, you know, organized. Could you uh, could you give us some insight into where your thoughts were? And bear in mind, we were in 1981. So, for context, I was I was three years old. How you still look? How you still look younger than me, by the way, is is utterly yeah. criminal. Um, yeah. But but what what was your main goal when you when you, this, your patient with with their sore knee? Was your goal to realign their knee, or were you going to stop as soon as they said? Was, was your target the symptoms, or were you looking for alignment, or were you looking for a sort of a, a mesh of both? Talk us through what what your thought process in in the early eighties was. Yeah. I, I... In the early 80s, uh, the thought process was just taking the stress off the tissue. Uh, we were, in, for most of the patients, we were not concerned about perfect alignment. It was just trying to like get enough support under them that uh, eased their tension. Uh, now, the patient variety is incredible. Some patients need 
100% support, even 110% maybe, uh, to get their symptoms calmed down enough, and then you can back off the correction. A lot of people need, uh, we used to joke, like if, if you put a little piece of uh, tissue paper in their arch, they would feel better from their plantar fasciitis. Uh, so so we, we've developed sort of the, the, the understanding of, okay, what, what are situations you just need a little bit of support? So if, if I can change the, the, the stress of the, of the tissue so it's less uh, impactful for the patient, the patient gets better, why, why would I need to go higher? Um, and then other people come in with chronic problems, chronic pain. Uh, I want to get their biomechanics as perfect as possible. So I, even now, I, I've been doing this for almost 40 years, and, and I can make two or three orthotics for a patient, at least for one foot, if not both, to like try to figure out you know, exactly what they need, uh, changing parameters all the time. Uh, and uh, so, so I love that. So you have the people who just need a little support, some of them just need for their running, some of them just need for their long distance hiking, and then you have the other people that, that couldn't walk without perfect support. And, it, and each individual patient, you have to figure out where they, where they exist in, in the thing. Perfect. So 81, 82, 83, I, th I think to use the word radical, that you're doing something quite radical at the time. I don't think that's an understatement. Inverting people 25 degrees and upward um, in, in California in the early 80s. Talk us through some of the pushback you must have got, some of the uh, conflict that must have arisen. Yeah, well from 80, so I made, I made all my own orthotics from 81 to 83. So as I was trying to figure out the technique, uh, and they really have no uh, relationship to modern day orthotics. I don't, I don't really I don't know what I was doing in those days, but I was trying to invert the patients and, and use root technology to create a, so it, 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 was, it was a little hit and miss. Um, then in 1983, uh, that's when I approached Dr. Root he came on board with, with you know, over the, over over a very short time, and he, and I, but to get him to really understand it, I had to have him make my orthotics, and and I had to you know give him like feedback on what they're doing, what I was using it for, and because he was the person, I mean everybody looked up to Dr. Root, and he was the person to. Um, to say something was was okay or not, um, so he he <laughs> made my orthotics exclusively from 1983 to 1988, uh, and as it was around that time, I started giving more talks and uh, uh, both Pro Lab USA and Richie Lab, Rich, uh, not Richie Lab, the Allied OSI Lab in Indianapolis they came on board and, and I went and spent time in both of those labs teaching the, teaching the technicians how to make it. Um, uh, but they were, the, they were the, so I had three labs that were making it, but if I had three labs, I had 20 labs saying, no, forget, we, we are not gonna invest one minute of time. Uh, and I, you know, it's like, I had more rejections than uh, than uh, uh, successes in, in that regard, um, and uh, and people said you're crazy. You know, let's. I don't want. I don't want anything to do with the, the inverted orthotic. And it's and 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 a lot of it was due to the fact that um, even though I was setting the parameters on how high to make the arch. They couldn't wrap their head around, if you invert somebody 30 degrees, the arch must be as high as the roof, and, and that's going to hurt somebody. And, and some, some labs did try it, and they said, no, patients couldn't tolerate it. They either sprained their ankle, 
uh, because it rolled them to the outside or the arch was way too uh, uncomfortable uh, or something else happened. So um, anyway, so, so th there was a lot of struggles in, the, in those uh, seven years or so. Um, a quote I read from 1983, something Dr. Root said to you, I think when he first saw or heard about this, this concept, I'm just going to glance down to make sure I read it verbatim. They will never work. They will cripple those that give them to you. Yet, I also read that um, at some point in 1983, he and you spent almost every weekend together. Because I think you're both, you're both California-based, 40 minutes apart or so. And ultimately, what, what ends up is you generating the paper that eventually ends in JAPMA. Uh, you turn up to his house with a five-page paper that's called the inverted orthosis technique, and you leave many, many months later with a 25 page document that he advised you call the Blake invert. It was on his advice that you, you took the eponymous approach to it. Could you talk us through that period? Cause that, I think that's kind of super interesting. Yeah. So, um, so I would just once a month, it wasn't every week, but, uh, it, oh, right. it, it is 90 miles, <laughs> but, uh, uh, a little past Dr. Kirby's house. Um, but uh, yeah, it, so during a three year period, 83 to 86, um, we, uh, I, I would go up there once a month uh, and uh, he helped me write the paper for the inverted orthotic. Uh, it yeah, went from about a five page paper, which was my little rough draft of it, uh, and after I left his tutelage for those three years, um, uh, it was a 26-page paper, uh, and uh, and it was it was incredible. I you know, people feared Dr. Root. People would uh, prior to me really going through that process, he was considered sort of onerous and demanding and perfectionist and and. Uh, you know, like people wouldn't actually talk to him. They would like, he would lecture and they like people, he had a few people that would, but they, people were scared of him. And, uh, and I learned the opposite. I mean, he was, he, he was just in a, a researcher that needed to be proved that something worked. And, and he held himself to the same standards, uh, that uh, you know that he um, that that he held everybody else to so and he held his son to it poor Jeff you know and uh, so he, uh, he he was the most kind loving I, I got to stay in their guest house <laughs> which was wonderful uh, and uh, so I didn't have to have a, 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 a hotel room but uh, uh, and then so we get the paper uh, done and um, we submitted to JAPMA 26 pages. Uh, they and and you were right, Ian. That the last day, you know, it's like we're ready to submit it. And, and the title of the paper was the inverted orthotic technique uh, by Rich Blake, uh, by uh, Dr. Rich Blake and Dr. Bert Root. He made me take his name off it. He said, No, this is this has to stand on your own. And uh, I go, Okay, Dr. Root. And uh, he said, you have to change the name to the Blake Inverted. This is your technique. You're the one who's done all this work on it. You deserve. So we submit it. And the Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association accepts the paper. Oh, oh, oh I love it. Okay. You can see. So they accept the paper. And the paper is... Uh, uh, shortened from 26 pages to two. It, was, it wasn't until Dr. Balmassey's book in 1995, I believe, or 596, that I was able to uh, actually uh, put the whole thing in into print. But uh, so it took it took another 10 years to to uh, have it have the whole thing in print. But so it went from it went from 26. Uh, pages down to two and then it, they also 
uh, after they said, we accept your paper for publication and not telling us that they've reduced it. They just mm -hmm. said, we've accepted. So I was excited. Then they spent three paragraphs cutting me down about how dare I call it the Blake and verdict. <laughs> and it's up to the profession to call it. It's up to you know peer review and that I was so wrong at calling this the Blake <laughs> So I showed the comment to Dr. Root and he just laughed. <laughs> he goes, Rich, get used to it, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it didn't ha ha harm your ability to publish. They, didn't, they weren't too upset with you because then two, three subsequent papers all, all popped up in JAPMA. So you, you didn't upset them too terribly, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> No, no. And, and <laughs> eventually, I became their special editor in, in sports. Yeah. I, I probably, uh, I probably got a was able to, uh, you know, uh, get my papers in faster than anybody else. <laughs> um, we're definitely going to come on to the, the technique itself, um, if that's okay. I know you've got millions of photos, and, and we will we'll also uh, will put a link to your blog in the in the comments here for those that don't know and haven't been on uh, rich's blog it's just an absolute tomb of information there's all sorts of of of, of uh, information there and particularly the photos the photos are great i love looking at old photos of casts because i'm a i'm a i'm a, I'm a loser like that like that <laughs> so um is there anything that's come in the comments craig that we need to touch on historically is not, there anything anyone at, wants to know no not at this stage there was a question on archful but we'll come to that Oh yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. I could spend the whole hour just just hearing stories, to be honest. But we should probably give people some 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 uh, technical content as well, if that's okay. So um, let's talk about uh, we talk about the history. Let's talk about the technique itself, um, and we can sort of lean from the history to the technique. Uh, you just started playing around in the lab with with the casts. You had the idea first. How did it go from from here to? to a device that we are, you are holding in your hand and talk us through the sort of stages. How many prototypes did you go through uh, and what was the, the sort of journey like? Well, the, you know, so I would just, I would invert people and, you know, at the heel. Um, and it was probably, probably my initial one was a little bit higher arch than if you put uh, a Kirby Skive on a, on a root, vertical or orthotic. Um, so it was some inversion of the heel. I was tilting, and you know, if you tilt the heel, because heels are either rounded or flat, you know, the flat heels invert more than the rounded heels. Uh, so that was, that was a big issue right up at the beginning. Um, uh, the, the thing that Dr. Root really helped me was that part, the lab part, because I, you know, I, I didn't have ex really experience with that. So he, he was the one who came up with the idea of, you know, of really lowering the arch. So he, his, his orthotic traditionally is the lowest in the industry for, for the inverted orthotic in the arch. Uh, he doesn't want it. And I think sometimes it's too low. Uh, other labs like ProLab would be too high you know, and not enough inversion in the heel. So every lab was a, a, is a little different. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I tried to publish a lot on how you decide on the arch height and where do you, where do you peak the arch height? Um, so the, basically the technique, one question you asked me, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little scatterbrained here, but one tech was like, so right at the beginning, the five to one, as we're playing with the technique, the five to one rule that if you, if you, so, so Dr. Root's theory in 1981 was that if you invert somebody a degree, the foot responded a degree. And I never found that. I, you know, the highest I found was like three to one or, or four to one, but it seemed like, in general, the five to one rule, and, and that, so five to, for every five degrees, you take the positive cast and you invert them, the foot responds a degree. Uh, and Dr. Valmassi, who deals with a lot of uh, flat-footed children and ligamentous laxity patients, uh, 
he 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 said, Rich, it's, it's probably with those that patient population, probably more uh, like eight to one. Uh, so that's why you know when we're talking about a thirty-five degree orthotic, if it's just an eight to one correction, you're only going to get four degrees of correction. You, you can't be really scared of going way up to thirty-five because it's you know for a lot of people that's it's not a lot if you're trying to you know invert them. For whatever reason. Um, uh, Ian, get, get me focused back on. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me just quickly ask something on that note. So, even as, you know, even 40 years ago, back in the early 80s, when you were writing prescriptions, you were still cognizant that, firstly, the, the degree post you wrote was not what you would expect the, the foot to move. And also, you were highly expectant of there being subject specific responses. So, it being kind of difficult to predict who is going to, going to consistently change by what degree. Have I got that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And I think that's right. important to note because a lot of, a lot of uh, podiatrists, new grads, otherwise, you know, present day, are, that's probably where their heads are at with how, you know, the, the kinematic effects of orthoses. But if you were to ask them, what were people in California doing in the 1980s? I suspect the answer would be, oh, they were just trying to realign everyone to, to rear foot vertical. But that doesn't sound like that was ever, ever on your, on your agenda. No, no. I think I think I think rear foot vertical has replaced uh, in the profession uh, neutral, you know, subtalar joint neutral position. Um, Good and bad. I mean, sometimes I think those are for some one patient. Uh, a vertical heel is the most important, you know, more stable. Uh, somebody who has eight degrees of tibial varum, uh, you want them somewhat inverted to 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 get the pull of the tendons through the ankle joint and and subtalar joint, you know, more correct. So. Uh, in my practice, I deal with pain, uh, whether it's from running, dancing, uh, walking, hiking, and and so I'm always, you know, tr tr trying to take, you know, what, how do I have to change this to make the pain go away? And then I think it's really important for podiatrists to let the patient know when you're undercorrecting them. So I grade my orthotics. I say. Okay, we, I give them A, B, C, D, or I talk about percentages, and I say, okay, John, we've helped you 60% of the overall correction I can do for you. And let's say they were 10 degrees everted, and I, and I, would, I put them to four degrees everted instead of vertical. Uh, so let's say that's 60, for, we'll make it easy. So 60%, I, I've made a 60% change I want him to know he's partially corrected. It's helped him. He may not need anything else, but down the line, if he gets a knee problem or a hip problem, he's not seeing me, he's seeing an orthopedic surgeon, and he's got in the back of his mind like, oh, I think my orthotics could be improved. I think Dr. Blake implied that, I, that, that the orthotics may help a little. I think that's really, really important, especially in this modern medicine because you know, the, the orthopedists look at the knee and or look at the hip and they don't look at how the person's walking and they don't say, oh, go back to your podiatrist to uh, check the orthotics to see if they're right. So, so I think the patient, I, I like to make sure the patient knows what their biomechanics are and, and then whether they can, it could be tweaked even further, even if I'm stopping at, at a, a less point. Cool. And the outcome <laughs> is... The outcome is usually symptom change or symptom reduction. It sounds like so, correct. Not dissimilar correct. to great. Couple of quick before we look at some pictures. I definitely want to look at some pictures of the actual technique being done and the, and the manufacture. Before we do, I remember scanning chapter twenty-two of Val Massey's book, which which you wrote, and you made reference to there being you know the Blake inverted orthotic is not one entity. I, from memory, there were fourteen variants or there may be more by now because this was this was a few years ago so could you just speak to that a little bit just in case people because you know people have got the idea that a uh, you know when you give something a name it's usually just one one thing whereas the blake inverted orthotic isn't one thing is it it's 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 an umbrella term that covers a numerous sort of design options 
Yeah, I, I think in the book uh, that Dr. Valmassi wrote, um, I, so what I was trying to get at is that, um, you know, people have various asymmetries between the two feet, which is huge. That's a huge concept with the inverted technique that you're not just, that you make the right orthotic different than the left orthotic because the, the left foot needs more support than the right. The goal is to get them sort of even, but one foot needs may need more support than the other. And so uh, in Balmassi's book, I outlined, you know, all the things that help the medial column, how you change the orthotic from 15 to 25 to 35 to 45 degrees. What are the things that correct for the lateral column? Uh, some people are, they're pronators, but they've sprained their ankle four times and there's no way you wanna invert them too much. So you, you take less of a support. Um, so you have to build up the lateral column really well to, to stabilize them. Uh, so, so I think of orthotics, I think this was the influence from both orthopedic surgeons and, um, and, uh, uh, physical therapists. It's like, so when I, so when I got into practice, you did, you did one surgery for the patient, you did one orthotic for the patient, and that was it. There's no, you know, like, okay, you've done it, this is all. And what I learned is, no, it's really a process. If you go into an orthopedist and they do a knee surgery and it doesn't work, they do a second knee surgery or they, set, you know, they, they, they try to figure out physical therapists are always changing techniques. And, and that's the big idea with, with all that is that it, orthotics should be looked as a process of changing biomechanics to help somebody make them, you know, should always make them more stable, you know, always go towards more stability and uh, um, and you may stop prior to full correction which is totally fine so. can we can we look at some pictures of if, if either, yeah. either you or Craig got the teed up can we look at the the sort of manufacturing process have we got some cars I'm, I'm conscious there may be people watching who who may not even know uh, you know how to make one of these or what to request or why we're making it in the first place could you talk us through uh, some of these please so this is the uh, this is just showing you know how I, I always when I make my orthotics I pour the orthotics vertical so the top so when the heel is perpendicular the top is parallel with the ground and then I tilt it from that point I know a lot of labs actually do the tilting within uh, the initial um, per, you know, pore of the orthotic, but I didn't want to do that because I'm always changing. So I want to I want to know when I go from 35 to 45 or back down from 45 back down to 25. If I'm making changes for the patient, I like the the top being level to the ground as my as my reference point. So this is a, a, a sort of looks like about 25 degree inverted can. I'm, I'm ready. I poured the patient and I'm ready to do my uh, plaster work. I'll, I'll uh, let you control this, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say, I'm just, with, I'm just trying to, which picture do you want? Uh, and which, which is the picture you wanted? There's that one. That one, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just... I mean, it's just so it's based on I base my correction on heel oh, position yeah, yeah. of the, the bisected. This this shows um, you know when you invert someone, the high point of the correction is at the talo navicular navicular first cuneiform joint. So that's the high point. You know, so it's a, it's you got the whole medial heel. And you've got the, ta you know, the medial side of the talus and the medial side of the navicular. Uh, uh, but, but you don't want to block first, you know, first metatarsal plantar flexion. So it has to stop prior to, to that point. Sure, yeah. And this, 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 this is interesting. So this is a, a, a patient who 
who is in, I, I think, a, a, a 55 degree inverted orthotic or something. You can see it's too much. Actually, they've, they've come off the orthotic a little bit. They're, they're, they've slid off laterally uh, a little bit. But it, to go for 55, that means the patient probably was standing about you know, 10, 11 degrees everted. So uh, we've got a pretty straight. So I measure the, the heel bisection is really crucial for every patient. I measure them before they get their orthotics. I measure them after they get the orthotics. But I'm also not just getting that feedback. I'm getting feedback from the patient. Do they feel like they're rolling to the outside? Have I gone too much to, to, you know, for them? Uh, do they feel that their that their their gait is smooth or it's really jarring to them? So all all of the concerns um, of controlling a patient too much, varicing them too much, I'm totally confident of. Um, and this shows, uh, Craig, if you pull the, the slide above that, um, uh, uh, that one. That one. Yeah, this, so this is this is a like a classic patient who had their they they pronate on the the, the windswept foot they pronate on the left they supinate on on the on the right side uh, unfortunately this person uh, had a uh, ankle replacement and the ankle replacement uh, permanently fixed their uh, their uh, heel in a seven degrees inverted position. So, uh, so I've been dealing with her for 20 years, trying to get enough uh, supination force under her foot to, to stabilize her. Uh, and then the, the left side needs, you know, uh, uh, you know by the inversion, we, I measure the heel bisection, and then I invert them the degrees using that five to one rule. So if she's five degrees everted by my heel bisection, I, will, I would order a 25 degree if she's uh, seven uh, say seven degrees everted I would order a 35 degree uh, inverted orthotic for that left side so left side needs an uh, pronation orthotic an anti-pronation orthotic the right side needs an anti-supination product, product. Yeah, so, so asymmetry is crucial and this sort of shows you know it actually is the opposite <laughs> for, for is it a whole nother patient but for that patient, they needed a more vertical orthotic on the left side, and they needed a highly inverted orthotic on, on the right side. So, so that to me is a key point that we we're, we're actually capturing the inversion, the the asymmetry of a patient, and we're and we're and we're dealing with that. We're not we're not taking a, a asymmetrical patient and just giving them this, the exact same orthotic, which I see all the time, and, and expect the foot just to magically uh, balance the asymmetry out. Cool. Okay, Rich, look, I'll just pull up this. What I'll, I'll do is I'll link, this is the, a YouTube video from your YouTube channel. Um, I'll link to this in the okay. comments, and it, it does actually take, um, take well, you know, people can watch it and go through the technical side of, of actually how it's done, but you, you, I'll just, if I just take a few screen, grabs um so I'll, I'll link to this video in the in the comments for if anyone wants to go and watch it oops stop share uh rich could i ask you what the the largest post you've ever done is how the the, the, the most you've ever ever inverted someone and what the what, what the indication was uh so i i inverted somebody seven seventy degrees seven oh uh, and uh, what I found with the high degrees is that I, I, was, I was slowly losing the reference points to the, the ground. So um, right now, and with the, the use of the Kirby Sky as a, as a modification, uh, now I tend to go around four, 45 is my max, and then I, I add more arch, I add more... Uh, I, I add more, um, uh, cur I add a Kirby Sky to it. Um, so uh, that tends to be, I usually can get people uh, from 16 to 20 degrees everted. So there's really, you know, these stage three, stage four posterior tip tendon dysfunctions. Um, 
I can get them pretty straight uh, with this, without using, having to use a brace. Uh, uh, some of them do have to, if they're hiking, of course, have to use uh, high top boots. But, uh, uh, but usually, usually if, if, if they have the flexibility, you know, when, when, you're, when you're correcting that much, the foot has to be able to respond, which is a big thing. I mean, it has to, you can't tilt somebody and have their big toe sticking up in the air somewhere. Uh, they, they, have, they have to have a mobile foot to do that. So sometimes you get like a stage four posterior tip tendon dysfunction or, uh, you know, a, a rigid pes cavus, a pes uh, planus foot that you can't make these corrections uh, with because they don't have the adaptability. Although I keep trying, uh, like I kept trying about this technique, uh, I, I, I send the physical therapist, I say, I, w I, want, I want that foot mobilized as much as possible. I want, I want them as strong as you can make it. I want them as, as supple as you can make it. And then I'm gonna try to tilt them some more. <laughs> um, anyway. When, when, when we think of inverting the foot, particularly when you hear big numbers, like whether it be 25, 45 or 70, I think 70 is a bigger number than, than even I expected. Um, the first thought is what, what problems may this, may this contribute to? Tolerance issues in the arch, I think we'll come to separately in a second. But we think about sort of, like we say, ankle instability or, or per perineal problems. And Simon Spoon has just put a comment in the... Um, uh, in the uh, in the comments saying Annie Munderman um, found that a 20 degree inversion resulted in increased perineus longus activity I think from memory that was via EMG so do are you worried about perineal uh, problems do you see many of them or have you seen many of them in your experience um, I, I think that's uh, one one thing I would I would take from that is that you know Orthotic devices make the ankle work more. Uh, if, I, if, if I take a flat-footed patient who's functioning a propulsive and they're, they're hardly using their muscles at all, and then I give them an orthotic that makes them work, they're going to be using all their muscles around their ankle. Their posterior tip should be working more. Their, their perineal should be working more. Uh, the, the gastric solia should be working more. Uh, so I expect more activity. Now, some patients who have uh, a disease like posterior tip tendonitis, uh, if you invert it, you relax the tension on the tendon, but you also make the posterior tip work better. So sometimes you have to then also use an ankle brace with it to cause and, and this is just when they're when they're sore and their tissue is has has broken down and you're rebuilding it for them. So I expect more muscle activity. Uh, to your question, Ian, no, I'm sorry. Um, yes, you know, Dr. Root's initial thing is that if I invert somebody, invert the heel more than four degrees. Uh, we run the risk of spraining the ankle. So that's, that's why I measure resting, I measure that heel bisection on all these patients. Where, where am I putting these patients? Am I putting them really inverted or I'm just, am I just taking them from an everted position to a more vertical position to a slightly inverted position? Uh, and then there's all these techniques to make the lateral column more stable. If you're at all at risk, uh, probably the, patient I see the most that are at risk are the patients with uh, uh, bow legs. They have genuverum, a high tibial verum. They're maximally pronated and they're still two or three or four degrees inverted. And they're having pronation symptoms because of that, that pronation. So I have to get them out of their maximally pronated position and invert them from there. So I may want to hold them seven or eight degrees inverted to, to, to get rid of their symptoms, uh, either temporary or, or, or permanently uh, based on the situation. And so I am inverting them. So what do I have to do? I have to have a high lateral heel cup. I've got to add a dentin modification or Fury. Fury is 
adding it is, is a cuboid raise under the, uh, on the positive. Uh, the dentin is a lateral column uh, support, um, you know, un underneath the, the fourth and fifth rays uh, on the, pla on the uh, plastic itself. But you had high lateral heel cups, lateral flanges, um, you know, and, and, and things like that. Sometimes they need gait training because if they're, if they're also in toed, they're, they're laterally unstable, uh, or if they've sprained their ankle, they're laterally unstable. Uh, so you've got to put them on strengthening programs. You've got to put them on, uh, um, you know, gait training to get them out toe a little bit more. Uh, so that it's it's a it's a whole complex process. Uh, but I but you're right. I don't want to invert them so they feel unstable to the lateral side. Uh, I have made uh, this is I I have followed this so closely because that's my biggest complaint, Ian. So I have watched this for 35 years and I make the inverted orthotic, I make 30% of the time, the root orthotic, another 30% of the time, other types of orthotics, some soft based orthotics. So I, I make at least five or six common types of orthotics all the time. And I have more problems with lateral instability with a root orthotic than I do with the inverted orthotic. Cause I, cause the inverted orthotic has, high lateral heel cups and lateral, you know, it's like part of the process of making it. It's almost like the modern day inverted orthotic is almost like um, a, a varus wedge uh, w with um, a, a UCBL. So I use really high heel cups now as part of the, the normal process. And of course they fit in hiking boots, They're, they fit in athletic shoes or whatever. Cool. They're not going to fit in your hands. Your, 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 uh, uh, while we're talking, your nice <laughs> while we're talking um, inverted devices, and while we've mentioned a couple of times there the, the posterior tibial, can we talk about a paper that's um, massively influenced uh, certainly my thinking? I know I know I'm not alone in that, and that's the paper that Dorsey Williams and colleagues published um, in a group of runners, where they essentially looked at, at kinematic measures and kinetic measures. Oh, thanks, Craig. Brilliant, and. Uh, from memory, they looked at people in three different, um, three different sort of scenarios, just running shoes, so no devices at all, a sort of four degree varus post, let's, let's call it a root device, uh, for want of a better word, and then a 25 degree uh, sort of inverted varus post, which I guess we could probably call a Blake device. And um, the fascinating thing about this paper was when they mean pulled the data, there wasn't any dramatic differences in, in some of the kinematic measures, particularly the peak eversion excursion. So there wasn't really much visual measurable change, but there was some dramatic reductions in, in particularly in, in the workload of tibialis posterior. And certainly clinically, we see, a, we, we see painful athletes or painful people become unpainful or pain-free athletes and people with inverted devices with no accompanying sort of angular changes. So we do, I just, I guess I want to get your feel on someone who's lived through the eighties that I, you know, or practiced through all of these eras. Um, has your thought process on this changed at all? Where do you sit on that sort of continuum between how important changing alignment is to the ultimate outcome, which is changing symptoms? Yeah, I, I think um, we, we know with, with all the studies on, on orthotics in the literature, we know that orthotics, you know, predictably will slow the motion down. We, we, we want that. I, a few people feel, uh, do not feel that, but I would say 99% of patients uh, will say they feel smoother. So I, I think it's slowing the, the motion down. Right, you know, with these studies, you can't measure the actual heel position they're using a bisection of the shoe versus the tibia. So they're using a tibial, you know, the tibial calcaneal angle, a uh, rear foot angle. Um, and, you know, who know, you know, who knows exactly what, I'm not, I don't, I don't think we, we're really changing that, how the tibia, because the tibia you works not only on the subtalar joint, I'm addressing the subtalar joint, but also, it's also moving around the ankle joint, it's moving around the knee joint, uh, so there's a lot of joints affecting that, that angle and the, so the, 
the tibia is a bad reference point for subtalar joint motion, and the heel we're not really seeing. So it's like, so we're not, I don't think we're getting a, a good idea of what's going on, but uh, Dr. Davis helped me with uh, one of my studies in the, I think it's early, early 90s. Uh, we, did we did runners with tr all with 25 degree inverted orthotics and, and, it, and it, it showed about a one degree change in those angles. Uh, uh, it, I think it was the first paper that came out that showed a, a actual po a good a good change in in uh, uh, the motion because you know uh, who knows if they had done a thirty five or forty degree inverted orthotic or or really if they were in boy I tell you you get you get a, if you take a, a runner in a like a uh, uh, a uh, a Brooks Beast shoe, a Brooks Aerial, uh, and after they've run in it for like 50 miles or 100 miles, it's it's now varus canted about three degrees. Uh, I, I would I would like to see him do that study with with that because <laughs> just with the shoe alone is going to make a difference too. So I don't know if I answered that, but no, it's fine. Um, so when we're thinking clinically about prescribing a Blake or when you are thinking clinically about prescribing a, an inverted device a Blake device um, do you call them Blake devices yourself by the way out of interest do you I think it would be weird for me if I refer if I wrote down my own name on a prescription form but anyway whatever you call them when you're when you're prescribing them are you looking at the foot type the foot posture the foot position or are more than looking at the the sort of presenting complaint or the pathology what's what's forefront of your mind when you're thinking a blake inverted device may be maybe the go to here yeah so so for me um, I, I sort of characterize uh, so I watch somebody walk and I listen to their complaints and I divide people into jock absorption people pronation people supination people. Uh, limb length discrepancy people, uh, tight, tight, weak muscle people. And that's my, that's, so that's my first exam. And then I'm, so I'm going to like start treating their biomechanics uh, in the first session, you know, start, uh, I, I may, you know, put them in over the counter orthotic uh, and, uh, and then bear wedge them to start uh, the whole process. Uh, it really depends on how long they've had their problem and whatever. But I, I categorize the people. Uh, you know, if I if they're not severe pronators, and um, I can use their forefoot to rear foot uh, as a way of stabilizing a forefoot valgus or plantar flex fir first ray or forefoot varus, because I think that's causing their neuroma, their bunion, their hammer toes, their metatarsalgia. Uh, I, I'm going to go to that plantar fasciitis, whatever. I'm going to go to that technique uh, over over anything. That's so. Um, and if they're uh, a shock absorber, I may I may go to a real soft based orthotic for them. Um, and then there's high, of course there's hybrid orthotics that you're making for people. You know, people people have a little. You're giving a, a lift for a short leg, and you're making a, a an, an inversion orthotic, but you're uh, you're giving a lot of motion in their post, and you're stabilizing their lateral column really well with a with a dentin or a, so. Uh, I like to think about all the biomechanics and like and try to figure out exactly what's appropriate at that time and just with practice you like you have to like what's their symptoms and and how can you treat those symptoms uh sometimes the patients get better they don't show back up you know you you've only started the process in your mind it's like oh this is going to take me 10 visits i'm going to analyze all this and uh you end up seeing them for two or three times. They're all they're better. You know why should they see you? You know so it's, so some of it's patient driven, some of it's me driven. I like to I actually like to keep it simple, stupid. I'm stupid if I make it too complex. So that's that is always hitting me over the head too, Ian. Like okay, make this simple if I can get away with it. Explain to the patient they have a severe problem if you think they do, or they have a minor problem. Um, 
and uh, and it usually goes well. <laughs> Before we wrap up, because I know we're getting to toward the hour, uh, the one one last story I wanted to ask you about was your interactions with Kevin, uh, Dr. Kirby. I know he was a student of yours, and I know that I've I've spoken to him and heard him say uh, on more than one occasion that, that the Kirby Skive, the medial heel Skive, was ultimately influenced by by you and and um, your inverted technique. Could you just talk us through if there was a moment when he came up to you in the in the in the in the, in the coffee room and said, you know, ask you know, ask for your take on it, or how did that go down? Uh, no, uh, you know, uh, so Kevin Kevin was was with a group of students that helped me do the initial inverted orthotics. So I had success, I'll blame Kevin. And uh, failures, I'll blame Kevin. So, uh, but, uh, you know, he was in that initial group. Um, he, you know, I was more in full-time practice, you know, by the time uh, that he became a resident and he started toying with it. So it was, it was independent. I mean, I was aware of it because I was still faculty till 92 and he graduated, he finished his residency, I think in 86. Uh, so we, there were, I knew what he was doing. He, he, he presented a huge paper about it. I was still trying to figure out the inverted technique and like, okay, what, okay, this Kirby sky, okay, where does this fit in? Uh, I, I, it wasn't with, with Kevin, it wasn't until um, probably, you know, 2000. So, so a, a good six or seven years after he came out with his paper on it, um, that I started using it as part of the inverted orthotic, it actually changed, completely changed the amount of inversion I had to do. So I was always worried when I go to 65, 70 degrees that I was distorting the foot too much. And so, so Kevin now had this, uh, this, this type of orthotic that could get me three and four more degrees, especially in my rounded heel patients, which the, the, the fl I don't know if you understand that the flat heel, if the, the heel is pretty flat, it really inverts well when you, when, when you invert the, uh, the positive, it inverts well, but, but a rounded heel can just, it just rotates and, and, and you don't get as much support out of those. So, so that was my first, um, it was around 2000, 2001 that I started using Kevin's technique as an adjunct to mine. And uh, it was very powerful. Uh, so I was very uh, impressed. And, and I, I typically do a two or three millimeter one to, to give my, to give me about two, two to three more degrees. Uh, I don't do a radical curvy because it's, it's just, it's an adjunct to the inverted orthotic. I have, however, taken patients, I have a, everybody who treats uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome has these patients that you can't touch their arch. You put anything in their arch, it kills them. And, but the curvy, so, so if you make a, an, a, a, a root balanced orthotic and do a curvy sky on that, and, and, and basically, it, you know, put the, uh, the arch down to nothing. It's, it's a very powerful orthotic for them, for that patient. So. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. I love, I could I, I say, I love the stories. I love, I love, <laughs> I'd love to be a fly on the wall and hear some of these historical discussions. I think it's important mm -hmm. for us to appreciate this history. Craig, um, how are we doing for time? How are we doing for questions? Oh, I think, I think, yeah, I, there's a few questions got asked, but they sort of got answered as we went through or they were covered earlier on. So I think now's probably a good time to wind up. But just before we do, um, we'll get a plug in for Richard's book. And unfortunately, my green screen is keeps uh, blocking it out. But yeah, but oh, let's okay. finish. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. you, you, yeah, that's better. Yeah, you don't have a green screen, but I'll put a link to the book in the comments for anyone who I is... I had, I had to read it before I came on, so I, I was I sounded somewhat smart. Yeah, I've just posted a link. Uh, oh, I'm trying to post a link in the comments now. So, look, thanks so much, Richard. The hour has gone very, very quickly. We, we have had a lot of people watching. Um, for those that have just joined, come back in 10, 15 minutes. The whole video will be on Facebook. We'll have it up on YouTube uh, later today. So, look, thanks so much, Richard, for your time. It's been really good. Okay, hang on, I just need to... Yeah. Stop share. Sorry, I didn't stop the share. So, um, 
very welcome. This is a pleasure. I, I'm very honored to to be invited. You, you guys, Thanks, Rich. You guys do a, such a wonderful, wonderful job. <laughs> Thanks for your time, Rich. Really appreciate it.